Hey everybody, Keith here, live in the lab, live in the Business Athlete Performance Lab. I promise y'all we'll be back. We're in the lab today with some Dua kicking us in. I always said we're going to bring some tunes to the show and we're going to continue on with that effort. So today we have a special guest coming in on a Wednesday. I'm your host, Keith Billis. Special guest, Eric J. Galb, from Florida. We're going to talk mergers and acquisitions, m and business. And I can say that um, I was fortunate to start a business successfully and then sell it. So I think Eric and I are going to have some great things to talk about. We're going to learn you know, you know, know, what it's like to take a business from nothing and sell it. We're going to learn what it takes to do that and so forth. So coming up, Eric Gall, uh, to talk about uh, mergers and acquisitions in business and, and, and so forth. But before we get into that, uh, today was a big day here in the lab. Really excited to announce that uh, we launched Truthbox. I've been teasing it along the way here for, for a few weeks. And as I've said, in the lab, our aspiration is to bring business philosophies and and, perform, and human performance philosophies and, and create solutions and create really cool, cool things using artificial intelligence. Well, along the way, we, we discovered our ability to create a really exciting product, an exciting solution in this world of AI-generated content, fake news, fake information. It's called Truthbox. We're not here to talk about it today. We'll talk about it another time. But uh, those that are tuning in right now, check out truthbox.ai. Watch the video. If you're in a C-level, C-exec position in this world running a public company, you need to watch the video, pay attention to it. Um, problems are a coming, and uh, we want to make sure you're ready for that. But uh, enough of that right now. Let's flip on over and welcome in our guest, Eric J. Gall from Florida. Eric, pleasure to meet you. Hi, Keith. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. It's kind of garbled. All right. So let's... Uh... Can you, uh, is that getting a little better there? talking again? Yeah, I will. Uh, how's that sound? Is that a little better? Oh, that's great. Now that, I can hear you. Is that better? Awesome. Cool. Cool. Yeah, cool. I think the music was playing over it. Oh, I think the music might have been playing place. over it. Yeah, of course. Of course. Jeez, I, yes. I, 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 got, I still got to get that sorted out here. <laughs> I'm a big fan of music and I think it's, 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 it's the soundtrack to life and I'm still figuring out the music side of things. And I'm sure Roland's over there and on the other, on this, on the other side of the fence saying, dude, you got to get this sorted out. But anyways, welcome to the show. Um, I'm glad to have you here today. Oh, glad to be here. Thank awesome. You. So you are in Florida. You're a mergers and acquisitions guy. Yep. Yes. And yep. I'm in Southwest Florida. Excellent. 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 And as I said at the beginning of the show, I, I started a company, successfully sold it, and eager to have that conversation with you. But before we get into that, um, we're all about merging athletics and business and those philosophies together. Uh, let's jump into that first. How is athletics part of your life? How, how does how does wellness affect your life? How do you weave that into you know the successful business life that you've been able to create for yourself? What do you do to start your day, end your day, middle of day? What do you need motivation with? Uh, let's talk about Eric's journey through the, the the athletic side of being a business athlete. Well, that's a that's a great question. And you know, one uh, I'd love to talk about because uh, uh, I grew up, I was the son of a baseball coach. Ah. So my dad, my dad coached high school baseball. He was a very good uh, high school baseball coach. In fact, he was, you know, made Hall of Fames in the state of Michigan. And, um, you know, I uh, loved playing baseball as much as possible growing up. And then, uh, you know, that's kind of parlayed itself. Uh, you know, those lessons that I learned on the field and in practice, you know, the discipline required to, you know, improve yourself day after day, you know, it's just kind of lessons learned that I've carried with me into even business brokerage on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, when I moved to Florida, I found out that they have what's called, I'll call old man baseball down here. <laughs> so they have leagues from 35 and over, 45 and over, 50 and over. I mean, they even have a World Series now where they have an exhibition game between two teams made up of 80 and over uh, age players. So, Come on. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to watch. It's all, it's, you know, the skill set, you know, has deteriorated to the point where, you know, <laughs> it looks more like a little league game, you know, a bunch of T ballers, but it's, uh, it's really entertaining, but I, I still play, I play quite a few games every year. I play in tournaments, you know, throughout Florida and the United States, you know, I try to get, you know, at least a one, you know, like in Cooperstown, New York or Atlanta, Georgia, oh, that's spectacular. You know, or somewhere where it's, it's fun to play and, you know, visit, play and the like. But yeah, we, uh, you know, so 
playing baseball, uh, selling businesses, you know, that's kind of my games. I, I love that because I don't think it's a typical response for many would hear, right? Typically you'd probably hear somebody who's, I'm just going to make some assumptions here. Either somebody's running a marathon, doing a triathlon or playing golf or we're doing maybe an individual sport. I don't think we typically hear somebody who's playing baseball actually, do we? Uh, no, I mean, it's kind of like a little, uh, cult of us, uh, old guys who just can't give it up. I love it. I love it. Did you, is it cliche, Eric, to think that, you know, those principles you learn athletically just naturally weave themselves into the business mindset or, or is it, is it actually a thing? Um, I just think they naturally, you know, blend into whatever you're doing i mean you know playing on teams and team sports which i did you know growing up i didn't do the individual sports as yeah. much but definitely the team sports so you know the interacting with you know other people the encouraging other people the um you know uh having the competition between you know you and one group against another group you know those things um, you know, lend themselves to business leadership skills, yes. uh, you know, competition, you know, in the workplace. So, you know, the things like striving to, you know, win some of these awards behind me. I mean, all those things are just ingrained. You know, you want to be the best. In order to be the best, you got to practice your craft. You got to, you know, improve your craft. You just got to, you know, dial in and, you know, focus in on winning that competition. Yeah, because it, because it's very clear from the wall behind you that you are not a competitive fellow. Yeah, obviously not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as we can see behind Eric's shoulders, uh, he has uh, certainly uh, plenty of accomplishments that I sure we will get into along the way here. But it, it's clear to me that, you know, what you've done behind you in the boardroom started somewhere and clearly it happened on the baseball diamond, right? So those, those, those attributes you gained as a young fellow growing up and, you know, you know, along the way, um, you, know, you bring them to business every single day. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, too, is you, you go back to, you know, those early days when I'm playing sports. Yeah. Um, you know, the teams I played on were very good. Yes. You know, and I was never the best player, you know, but I came out and I competed and, you know, I, I learned from, you know, the older guys that I played with, you know, kind of their leadership skills. I learned from the coaches, you know, good, solid, you know, Hall of Fame type coaches. I mean, I had I was very blessed, you know, in that respect. So you know, taking their lessons and applying them to life and to business of just, you know, I mean, it, the results, you know, I, I think have shown themselves. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very proud of the background that I have in athletics and how I've been able to translate it into business. That, that that's, one. that's spectacular. I, I, I myself b believe the same, same way. I, I obviously with, you know, with creating the business athlete performance lab, I just think those philosophies are very similar. I've been fortunate to have been around, professional athletes and, and so forth, spending time with them. And they're, they're always curious about guys like yourself or myself, what wires us. And then we're always curious about those athletes and what wires them. And then what I find is that we're wired very much the same way, right? We just happen to take our work to the boardroom or to a business and they take their work to a, an athletic field, right? Or an athletic arena, right? So, but at the end of the day, I find the principles are remarkably similar in terms of the drive, the competitiveness, and you look behind you, they are the same. Like you're competing to win every single day you get up, you compete to win. It's clear to me. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's probably no more satisfaction than winning, right? It's true. <laughs> I yeah. mean, cause you, you set it out as a goal, right? You yes. say, okay, this is what I want to achieve, you know, and whether it's, you know, taking something a day at a time, you know, a month at a time, a year at a time, you know, you take a look at those goals just as athletes do. And they say, okay, you know, our goal is to, you know, win a division championship or, yes. uh, you know, get to the world series. If you're, you know, a major league baseball player, you know, my goals are a little bit different. It's like, well, I want to be number one in Florida or, you know, I want to be, you know, top 10 in, you know, this association I belong to, Yes, yes. you know, worldwide. And you take those kind of goals and you say, okay, what do I got to do to get, get there? You know, an athlete will say, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to work on these, you know, weaknesses or deficiencies, you know, where I look at the same thing, you know, well, I need to improve marketing. I need to, you know, maybe, uh, 
you know, redirect marketing. I need to do something a little bit different or I need to do more of something, you know, to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. So it's just, it's the same kind of goal setting and then the uh, discipline to stick with your plan, you know, until you can execute it. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, how do you measure your wins? I, I think great coaches measure wins through failure, through losses, right? Reflecting upon what didn't go well so that they can win more. How do you, how do you measure your wins besides what's behind you? Well, you know, uh, like we just talked about those little time scales, you, you know, you can break things down into days and months, Yeah, you know, and other time periods and you just say, okay, you know, the first thing you want to do each day you get up is just win that day. Right. Yes. So, you know, my goals for the day are to, you know, accomplish these things and you know the day goes by and i've accomplished them and maybe a couple more things i've won that i feel like i've won the day um you know but there's a lot of days you know where there's diversions thrown your way or you know extra things that come out that you didn't anticipate or didn't plan and you know you've got to react to them and you know you don't accomplish half of what you thought you were going to that day or what was on your list and you go okay you feel a little bit defeated sometimes, but then you have to, you know, instead of just sitting there and pout about it, you got to say, okay, what can yes. I do different next yeah. day, you know, to catch up, to get back on track, you know, to, you know, achieve those longer term goals. Yes. So yeah. everything's kind of day to day basis. You know, we, you know, I assess what I want to do at the beginning of the day or the evening before a lot of times I'll say, okay, these are the things I want to accomplish, you know, tomorrow you set out to do it you accomplish them great. If you don't, you know, the end of that day, you think about, okay, what do I need to restructure for for tomorrow to win tomorrow? Right. Right. In in previous conversations we've had with some of the guests last week and and even just people I speak to on a day-to-day basis when I'm coaching and and advising or consulting along the way, um, execution appears to be the hardest thing for many people. We all have ideas. We all want to do something. We're all about out to, you know, achieve success, but then it comes to, okay, now I got to do it. And then it just, it, everybody, many freeze. I look behind you and clearly you're able to execute. What is the tip that you offer somebody or you offer somebody listening? Who's just struggling to execute on something they are trying to achieve. Well, I mean, execution takes discipline, right? I mean, there's so many distractions that you have during the day that can take you off the game, right? It's just like, um, you know, if I'm at bat in a baseball game yeah. and I'm focused on the pitcher and I, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I see the runner take off towards second base, I've taken my eye off ball. Right. Right. And it makes it infinitely more difficult to hit. Yes. So it's just that, you know, uh, you know, narrowing that focus in on what you need to accomplish at that moment or that day, you know, and then having the discipline not to get distracted by those things that, you know, come your way. And, I, you know, it's, it, that's what's so difficult about execution. Isn't it though, right? Because it, 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 yeah. in my experience, it's easier to add to the to-do list instead of remove, I'm sorry, instead of add to the to-do, to, to not do list. So then when you, when you don't add to the, to the list, you can at least stay focused, right? I know entrepreneurs, myself included, tend to get the old shiny, shiny object syndrome, right? Where we look somewhere else and start going yep. elsewhere, right? So staying focused is, is really that, is that key and then executing on it, isn't it? Yeah. And it's staying focused, but it's also knowing when to step back, yes. you know, and just leave something for a little bit of, of time, you know, just so it kind of soaks. And, you know, if you're getting frustrated with something, you know, that takes you off your game too. I mean, you know, we'll go back to sports. If you go up, up the bat with a bad attitude, with an attitude, Oh, I don't know. I, you know, what am I doing up here? I'm not going to, you know, can I really hit the ball right now? Am I really, you know, you know, in the moment, you know, if you have those distractions, you know, the best thing to do, you know, as a, like if I'm batting, I step out of the box, take a deep breath, you know, refocus myself for a bit and then step back in. Same thing with business. You know, if you're struggling with something or there's distractions that have, you know, totally thrown you off, you know, your mindset, right? You need to step back, reset yourself. And then step back into it. 
and you'll find that, you know, that time, that little bit of time away, and it can be, you know, a matter of seconds, minutes, hours, you know, months, you'll find that, you know, when you step back into it, you know, your brain has processed things over time and you'll find that you can not just pick up where you left off, but, you know, maybe even pick up a little bit further ahead of where you were, you know, when you you've had that time away and you're not sitting there frustrated or, or distracted, you know, on, on your task. Yeah. The, the value of time I've never, I've never considered it the way you, you just presented it in terms of stepping to the batter's box, but you're right. Whether it's seconds or whether it's minutes, it's stepping out of the moment, pausing and reflecting and, and then gathering yourself and, and moving forward. I, I myself have learned the value of time as I've gotten older in life and s- slowing down and observing. And it's incredible when you have the awareness to do it, but it's difficult if you don't have the awareness to do it. So thinking about it through the lens of a baseball game is, is remarkable, actually, because you know you're in the spot. The ball is going to be thrown at you. You have a choice either to step out or you got to be engaged, right? And you have to have that awareness. Yeah, I mean, you know, they talk about, you know, in hitting a baseball, your focus and concentration, you know, kind of maxes out at about three seconds. Interesting. Yeah. You know, so you, you'll, you'll see batters with the pitchers just sitting there and they're not throwing the ball. You know, after a while, you know, if it gets too long, you know, they they call time and step out. And it's because they know, they know that, you know, it, their focus or their concentration after three seconds starts to wane. Yes. So it's the same thing if you're doing, you know, a task in, at work, you know, after a certain amount of time, you know, your brain just starts wandering or focusing on other things or other distractions start entering it. And, you know, you need that time to call time, step back, you know, allow your brain to, you know, process whatever it needs to process so you can get back and be focused in on what it is you're, you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Again, yeah. I mean, I use that, I use that on a, I use that constantly all day long. Do you? Yeah. 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 Work hard, pause, reflect, and then, and then go again, right? Yeah. You know, it's the moment when, you know, you know, the distractions start, you know, uh, coming in, like, you know, maybe a couple phone calls just kind of throw you off something that you're really focused on. Yes. Um, you know, when you want to, you need to complete it, you know, quickly and all of a sudden, you know, your mind's just wondering, okay, what was that phone call or what was this or what was that? You know, uh, you know, you know, I know, my email's starting to fill up because I haven't paid attention to it in the last, you know, how well I, you know, cranked out this document. You know, at that time, it's kind of like, okay, my mind is just filled with other garbage that I need to dispose of in order to finish this. Yeah. So let's step back, dispose of the garbage, check the phone, check the email, see what's in there, reply to what's important, you know, get all that off your plate get back to work task at hand focus 100 percent on it and shit out yeah that, that that's i could not agree more that's why i've always you know subscribed to this business athlete philosophy where you know my day starts with me first um stay out of work email stay out of everybody else's problems and everybody else's emails to me because the moment i start getting engaged with all respect with you now i'm on your time right so or i'm on somebody else's time in my inbox so i really try to be focused and disciplined on from morning coffee, take care of, take care of dad, take care of Keith here and, and physically, mentally, emotionally. And then I can now start giving to you and give to my inbox and give to everybody else and and start taking in the distractions. Because if I don't, those distractions just overwhelm me, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So time, time's the only commodity we have that we, you know, we can't replace. So what's more valuable than that? Right. Very so good. you don't want to waste it. And, uh, you know, any tricks that you can learn to, you know, stay focused, you know, uh, you know, and execute to your plan, you know, are, are critical to being successful. That's it. That's it. Hey, in conversation with Eric J. Gall here in the lab, live in the lab with Keith Billis, your host here on on Tuesday, not Wednesday, Tuesday, September 19th, uh, talking business philosophies, athletic philosophies, weaving baseball into the conversation, stepping into the batter's box and pausing from time to time before you move forward. Now, Eric's an expert in uh, in mergers and acquisitions. So I think it's 
you know, only apropos, we pivot our conversation to uh, that topic. So those of you that are curious on the business side of things about what it's like to sell or, 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 or purchase a business, you probably want to, you know, keep listening. Now, Eric, I sold my company. Um, so when, when Roland and when producer Roland said, Hey, we have Eric joining us, he's in the M&A space. I immediately perked up. Um, and I want to, I want to share something with you that, and, and I want you to comment on this. A good friend of mine, uh, Ray White uh, said to me uh, at the time, he said, Keith, when you're selling your company, selling your company is like solving a 1000 piece puzzle. Every single piece absolutely has to fit or else you won't get the check. And you think to yourself, okay, a thousand pieces, not that bad. But wow, once you get into the diligence, once you get into the process of selling your company, that statement could not have been more true because you can get to piece 998 or 999 and not find those other two pieces or not come to terms on those other two pieces. And during the entire diligence process, the entire thing could, could, could not complete. So, I found that statement when somebody says to me, Keith, what's it like selling your business? I tell everybody it's like, it's like solving a 1000 piece puzzle. What's your comment on that from somebody who does this for a living? <laughs> That's a pretty good analogy because I mean, it's incredibly difficult to sell a business. It's, it's not like selling a car or selling something, you know, tangible that people can see every element of it, like a house or mm -hmm. something of that nature. It's, it's the most unique type of sale I think there is because you know, from my perspective, I'm trying to market something that I can't really tell anybody who it is, right? Right. Because of confidentiality. You know, you want to you want to maintain you know confidentiality so customers don't uh, you know walk to another uh, competitor. You want don't want your employees, you know, getting uh, frightened and leaving for another opportunity. Right. You don't want um, suppliers, you know, accelerating, um, you know, the rate at which they bill you. So, you know, the, you know, I've got to attract people and I got to tell them just enough to get them in the, in their interest, but not enough to tell them exactly what it is they're buying. So that's the, the primary challenge of what I do, um, you know, and then obviously, you know, once you do get someone where they feel the business is a fit and they're comfortable with the seller, because I think a lot of these deals get done on, you know, buyer and seller liking one another and trusting one another. Right. Yes. So when, when that happens, you know, you've got a much, much better chance of getting the deal done. But if you break that trust and anywhere along the process, your deal's done, you know, the, the buyer's just going to walk away because they're going to be afraid that, you know, something's not right about the deal or, um, you know, that they can't trust you, the seller, to transition the business to them. And, you know, it won't make sense. Yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I find that, you know, at that point, you know, I got a pretty good idea if I think I can get this to clo a closing table, if buyer and seller like and trust one another. But then again, you, you still got to get through all the due diligence. You know, you got to look at the financials, the operations, the equipment, you know, you got to get a lease transferred in a lot of times or, you know, a, a, a building valued and, and acquired, or you've got financing that needs to be uh, put in place by the buyer. So there's all these things that can break down, you know, even after the liking and trusting one another that can kill a deal. Yeah. So, you know, my job is to kind of shepherd both parties through that, you know, remove all the roadblocks as best I can, you know, and hope, like you said, those last two pieces of the puzzle, you know, are found and fit. It, right. And, you know, then you've got your puzzle completed. You can get a deal done. It's 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 so true. I, I, I was really surprised during my process, um, the value, uh, I'm sorry, of, of the value of time and how that plays into the entire equation. So how my broker, you know, would ask me a question about a decision we were considering on a Monday where my emotion might be a certain way from the weekend or a, the certain way because of work or emotion might be a certain way because of life. And he's like, you know, Keith, here's something to think about, but don't, we're not deciding on it today. I go, why not? No, no, just, just, just sit on it. Right. And then you sit on that for a few days, maybe a week. And then you come back and say, so what are you thinking? And it's incredible how, when you put time behind you, how you can use that to your you know, advantage or, or, and, and how, and how he, and how he used time to 
manage the process because i was an eager guy i'm like let's get this thing sold let's go run 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 he's like hold your horses right and it was incredible to me how that whole process worked and i learned a lot you know the horse trades the way the whole process would would work to somebody who's considering selling their business who's listening to this right now explain that it's just not a quick quick let's go it's going to be sold immediately well you know a lot of it just depends on you know uh, so many moving parts right because you know if you if you put yourself in the buyer's shoes right they want to make the right decision for themselves yes so they're going to want to take the time and hire the right advisors and you know make sure that they do the deep dives necessary to understand that what was presented to them is actually what they're buying right and you know if it's like uh, you, you you know we get uh uh, quality of earnings efforts by CPA firms where they'll come in and they'll dig through the financials, you know, you know, a couple of degrees deeper than the uh, buyer would, you know, just to make sure that, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, $17,000 uh, purchase that was made in 2020, you know, was actually for, you know, COVID equipment and it was a one-time event, you know, they will dig that deep into it. Whereas, you know, a buyer, you tell them, you know, the seller tells the buyer, yeah, some, you know, that was for just for, you know, some blowers we had for air circulation, for COVID, you know, and a buyer will go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Fine. Right. right? right. But, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, the, the adage is, you know, buyers are liars and sellers are storytellers. <laughs> um, you know, people will forget and maybe not even intentionally, you know, stretch something or misrepresent something. And you need to make sure that as a buyer, you're getting what you paid for. And that buyer is going to drive that process and that they're going to drive it in a timetable that makes them comfortable, um, you know, with that final acquisition. So trying to push a buyer too hard is generally backfires on you, but, but you can't let them sit and hold the deal hostage forever either. Right. So, you know, part of my job is to, you know, set the timeline, set the timetable and keep everybody on track to getting the deal done in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Because the seller, that includes, go ahead. Yeah. That includes educating the seller on, you know, why it's taking so long. Right. A lot of times they don't understand. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's when I put the other hat on of looking at business, to, looking at businesses to acquire, it was, it has been quite surprising to me how many business owners a haven't been prepared to sell or B weren't prepared for the level of diligence that myself or my partners were wanting to do on their business. And I, I would, I would often say, but yes, I'm, I'm happy to cut you a check for millions of dollars but I need to ask a lot of questions and go through a lot of kind of uncomfortable conversations about your business. And then all of a sudden things would change. And I was like, well, yeah, but I can't give you the money unless you're going to give me the information I need. Why, why does that happen so often, Eric? Well, um, I, I think a lot of it is just education of the sellers and, you know, a, a good broker is going to educate their seller up front. Right. Um, and they're also going to be very demanding of their seller up front. You know, for example, you know, we dig through the financials with the seller. Um, you know, I have, you know, one-on-ones with them going through and challenging them on the things that they say that, you know, were either one-time non-recurring expenses or they were, um, you know, a personal benefit to them and not something that a new owner would necessarily inherit. You know, those, those those add backs to the bottom line need to be challenged because they are eventually going to be challenged by a buyer. Right. So if I don't challenge them and I don't have a good story, I'll never be able to tell a buyer a good story. Neither will the seller. And you know, it, it, it won't count. Um, and if it doesn't count and because businesses sell on multiples, if it's a $50,000 expense and it's uh, you know, a, six times EBITDA multiple. Yeah, it's 300. You know, you're talking $300,000. Yes. You know, you're not talking of a small amount of money for the seller, right? So, 
you know, those discussions need to be had by the broker and, and the uh, and the seller. And yes, I find all the time because I work with buyers as well and we'll get information from another broker. And, you know, some of the stuff that's in there, you know, just doesn't pass muster. Um, you know, they took the easy way out and didn't do didn't challenge the seller, uh, you know, on, on some of these things. And, you know, I'll go, you know, on the flip side of financial is just the whole operational end of it and getting the information on employees and customers and, you know, uh, suppliers and, you know, not necessarily names, right. Because that should, should remain confidential, but, you know, getting the whole story of the business put together and how it operates and, you know, the seller's involvement and, you know, the employees and who's important in that employee pool to make sure that they're retained post-sale for a successful transition, getting all that information documented up front, getting it over to a buyer early in the process, you know, answering all of their basic questions is very, very important because what it does is it establishes trust between the buyer and the broker and then the buyer is going to challenge those the, right. the seller with some of those questions. And when those seller answers those questions with the same answers that are in the documentation as provided by the broker, you've kind of completed that circle of trust. Yes. So buyer, seller, broker trust one another because they know the information is complete and accurate. And now you have complete and accurate information you know, you can move much more quickly to, you know, the offer phase and, you know, subsequently due diligence and hopefully a completed transaction. Yeah. It's interesting when you say the information, you know, all those I's dotted and T's crossed and building that trust. When we built the, our first company to sell it, uh, we were very neurotic about having the data organized and having as as much structure to the business as possible so that by the time you as my broker came in you were able to look at everything immediately instill confidence in yourself so that you can go talk to sellers mm -hmm. and then show them that same confidence and it was simple things that i was neurotic about but it, it turned out during the diligence process the buyer would look at us and say wow you guys really have this button down like good for you guys for paying attention to these little things that many don't think about and just maybe those, those business athlete and neurosis is a structure things that you think about right so <laughs> it's really what kind of, kind of kind of set us apart differently which is making sure everything was always done the right way it just made the process later on so eric Talk to me about, um, you've done a lot of big deals. Um, the biggest one you took along the path and then, and then it fell apart and why it fell apart. Those aren't irrelevant, but talk to us, you know, talk to myself and the audience about uh, that journey, about taking something significant, it failed, why it failed and, and how you pulled yourself out of that failure. Yeah, excuse me, I have a wipe away the tears. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I here um we uh got it right up to closing and uh it was a it was a dental practice it was a very nice one um and we got right up to the closing and the seller called me and said i can't go through with this and we started talking about it and it made sense and i backed him in his decision um but it was one of those things where little things um that were requested or asked for along the way from the sell side were ignored by the buyers. You know, we talk a lot about the uh, sellers not being prepared, you know, for, for kind of the uh, buyer's questions. This was like the opposite instance where the buyer wasn't prepared for the seller's questions. So in this case, uh, what he wanted is he wanted a clear picture of what the transition process would look at like post sale. Ah. What would the level of his involvement be if they brought in another uh, clinician? You know, uh, what his pay structure would be like for training that clinician? Because they wanted a four-year commitment out of him. So if he were to stay there for four years, you know, eventually they're going to have to replace him. And it's going to take someone a year or two to be trained in order to do what he did. Because this was a, it was a prosthodontist. It was a very uh, high-end specialty practice. 
yeah. with, you know, a lot more technology that you'd see in your typical dental practice. So it, there was, there was a uh, learning curve for a new uh, clinician coming in and they they kept saying, Oh, we'll take care of that after closing. And he kept asking the question and really super nice guy. Um, but he would ask the question, but he would ask it in a super nice way. And they would just get, say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that. But the fact is they spent a month kind of just deferring the answer. And they said, okay, we're a week away from closing. Are you ready to go? And his answer was like, I can't do it because I don't know what, you know, my life looks like after this transaction and you failed to address it. So, you know, uh, did he blame you? They're like, is there anything? do to rectify this and i i'm like well you know you spent a month telling him that you would deliver something and then you know as we got to the week a week before closing you then told him you'd handle it after closing so you know now you've got him not trusting you and i asked the doctor you know could you if they delivered this you know could you trust him and he said no, you know, there's a few other items that, you know, they've done along the way where I felt I was kind of ignored or things that I've asked for politely. And, you know, they've either deferred or ignored or, you know, they treated someone like the landlord and they, he felt inappropriately. He's just like, I don't think they're the right buyer for me and my staff. I just don't trust them anymore. So, you know, there's an instance where I lost a deal, you know, it was lost you know, kind of the opposite direction of where most deals are lost. Most deals are lost when the seller doesn't provide something to the buyer and the buyer loses confidence. This was the other way around. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's interesting to me. I was just about to ask you, how often does that happen? And it doesn't happen often, does it? I think that's probably the only time, you know, I don't know, 200 deals I've ever had it happen where the uh, seller said, I just, I'm, I'm not selling in your experience, to these people. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not selling to these people, Eric. In your experience, do, <laughs> do do the sellers often care after they get the paycheck from the sale, or is it, or is it, or, or is, is this a, an extreme situation where somebody's like really like, okay, I'm getting, I'm, I'm selling the business, but I really need to know what's happening next. Um, you, you know. <laughs> Most sellers, you know, once they get the their money. paycheck, you know, they're happy. <laughs> yeah. They're happy. Um, you know, but there are, a, you know, there are a significant number of sellers who, you know, it's incredibly important to them to have their employees taken care of, you know, the, you know, their business name, you know, perpetuated, you know, but they'll tell you that up front. You know, and when you know that, you know, I'll have those conversations with a buyer. So if right. I know that it's more than just about money for, for a seller, uh, you know, that's going to be made clear to buyers right up front because I want the buyers to know because I don't want them to ignore or, you know, not respect that seller's wish and then cause a problem later on down in the transaction process. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. Eric Gall from Florida, talking mergers and acquisitions here live in the lab today. Um, Eric, how do you get your business? Do you, Are you guys referrals? You've been around for such a long time and I know you're involved, you're actively involved in many associations. Clearly you're touching many businesses in the South Florida area. Is business come largely by referral at this point or are you actively marketing yourself? Well, you know, we do a little bit of marketing, but yes, I would say 85%, 90% of my business comes from referrals and it's relationships that I've developed, you know, over, you know, 14, 15 years of doing this. And, you know, those relationships were developed, you know, based on, you know, uh, you know, certifications that I've earned, uh, you know, uh, awards that I've won, you know, uh, successful deals and people talking about it to other people you know, or bringing their friends and family members who have businesses as well. So, you know, I've always been, you know, a believer of success, you know, precedes more success, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, and, you know, just getting the word out on your successes is what's brought in people who I would call, you know, uh, 
you know, raving fan referral agents. That's spectacular. Right? Of course. So, yeah. So, you know, once they see what I've done, you know, understand my process, you know, they're, they become able to communicate it for me and at least get my foot in the door. So yeah, I'm, I'm almost completely referral now. Um, you know, and even today, I mean, I had a meeting with a, uh, uh, a group of business coaches mm -hmm. who are in the dental medical field mm -hmm. and they were, uh, interested in referring me, you know, their clients who are ready to sell. So, you know, I, as many conversations as I can have with folks, you know, and, uh, you know, attorneys, uh, CPAs, you know, any, any business type advisor, coach, et cetera, you know, are working with business owners. Um, you know, those are the right people that I market to and talk to. Um, I don't go out of my way to do it, but I do it in order to, generate referrals from them yeah your, your reputation is the name of the game when referrals are driving your business right yeah. so good for you that's uh that, that that's a great story what's the future look like for the business what's the future look like for the vision of uh, of your company well we've grown quite a bit over the last uh, few years i i really uh, enjoyed kind of just being um you know the the dancing bear and the one-man show you know for <laughs> for quite a while and, you know, not having to, uh, you know, mentor and educate and make, you know, a lot of decisions for other people. But, uh, you know, we have, you know, slowly added over the past uh, four years. So I do have a team underneath me now. You know, that team, some of them are doing really, really well. Some are, you know, young, ambitious, you know, and, and require a little bit of mentoring. So I've kind of switched, you know, some gears and I'm not a... Um, 100% uh, focus on doing all of my deals for myself. I'm actually mentoring up kind of that, you know, next wave of young, uh, young folks who young intermediaries who can, you know, kind of hopefully follow in my footsteps. So Eric, you, you said it, you said the one man show dancing bear story. So I'm, I'm going to play upon this one. So you woke up one day going, all right, I want to grow my business, but I'm the one man show like many entrepreneurs, like many business leaders. And you looked in your mirror time and time and time. And then one day you said, all right, I got to go get some help. I got to go hire some people or I got to bring some people to help me grow this thing. Uh, why did the light go on for you finally? And why did you finally stop the one man show? You brought it up. So what made you kind of say, all right, I guess I should go get some help to scale this thing. Cause Eric, you know, as well as I do, it's a big challenge. I just had this conversation last night at the rink with another entrepreneur hockey dad. And he's like, yeah, I want to grow my business, but I don't know if I want to slow down and train some people and bring them in and then, and then step back from my business and bring some more people in. He goes, but I know we should, but I just, I don't know. It's just hard to stop to move forward, right? It's hard to stop to move forward. It, it is. And, you know, it, 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 uh, you know, my, my wife actually helps me in the business and I, I can honestly say that, yeah. you know, I had to fight her. All, I've been fighting her all along the way on this. She, just, she was happy just, you know, kind of just being kind of the support staff for me right now. when she's doing you know, support work for everyone else. She's kind of, you know, uh, you know, yes. it's more work for me. Right. Yes. Um, you know, so, you know, the trades off and, you know, a new set of shoes, you know, every month. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Or a bag or yes, I get it. I get it. Right. Right. So, you know, and having those discussions with her, um, you know, I've got, you know, she's kind of on board now, a little bit more on board, but we're, you know, we're moving forward. Yeah. And I kind of like, I, I grew up in, when I was in corporate America, I led teams. I yes. mean, I led teams on a daily basis. So it's, you know, you come in, you'd see the same faces, you, you know, set your goals, you know, like we've been talking about, and then you, you know, establish, you know, the steps and the process and steps and, you know, you go out and execute and, you know, it's the same thing here. Now we've got a team. So it's a matter of doing the exact same things. You set your goals, it's you know, and then you, uh, you know, put in place the processes and the methods, the tools, you know, that you need in order to go accomplish those. I, I now I, I still have to do the same thing for myself, right? Because I enjoy doing it so much, but I also have to look out a little bit for the other folks as well. 
I suspect it happened probably quite organically. You just kept doing your business and you said to your wife, all right, I just need one more thing. And then another thing happened and then, okay, we need some help. And then, and then you woke up one day going, wow, we, we got a bunch more trophies behind us. We have some more people here. And it probably was as organic as anything, wasn't it? And you kind of looked around yourself going, wow, we've built something quite significant here. It's pretty cool to do that and build that team around you. Yeah, it, you know, it started, I think, you know, it started more with, uh, you know, people recognizing, you know, some of the awards coming in yes. and they're going, well, I want to, if, if you're getting those awards, you can teach me how to get those awards. Right. Yes. So I brought in more experienced people who kind of understood the process, had executed the process. I didn't bring in, you know, people who had no idea what they were doing. Right. Um, and there were people who approached me and said, hey, can I come aboard? And, you know, at that point in time, I'm looking, well, if I don't have to fully train you, I can just show you what I do. Um, you know, uh, as we take you take on a new project, I'll walk you through what I would do on that project. So you learn. Handling it that way um, kind of limited the amount of training time and coaching time that I've had to do with, you know, the vast majority of the folks that we we brought in. So that's been very helpful. Gotcha. Um, but the other the other piece of it, you know, kind of why I was looking at why do I need to bring people in? And it's, you know, uh, vacation time. Yes. You know, uh, handing things off to other people. So they only call you when there's something very critical during that time, but they can handle buyer seller meetings for me while I'm gone. Um, you know, if there's, you know, an emergency where someone's got to go and check in on a, a business owner, or there's a buyer who flew in for that week and I'm on vacation and someone needs to meet with them, you know, all that can still happen, you know, without me there. Right. So it, it's freed me up a little bit more. I mean, we talked about, you know, playing baseball, going to yeah. uh, Cooperstown to play yeah. or going to a player wherever we go to play, you know, West Palm Beach. I've got a tournament in November, so I can get out of town for a week, you know, um, play baseball during the day, work at night and, uh, you know, catch up on work at night, you know, and, you know, kind of enjoy life a little bit more. So that it's is definitely been benefit yeah. that is the business athlete lifestyle that's uh that's great you're you're you're, you're managing all uh all sides of the coin there eric um we talk about uh, uh we, we we talk about selling businesses we talk about buying businesses um mergers acquisitions and so forth um the the one tip you could give somebody who's listening to us right now who wants to sell their business a quick soundbite what are you telling that person well, the first thing is, is get everything in order, especially your financials. Uh, you know, I uh, so many times I will pick up a set of books, you know, whether it's financial statements or tax returns. And, you know, there's just, you know, it's very difficult for me to understand kind of what's been done, you know, over the past three, four or five years, um, because they've changed accountants multiple times or they've, you um, you know, they, they're, they created a lifestyle business where they're running all their expenses through the business, you know, their mm -hmm. meals, their travel, you know, all of that personal expense through the business. If you can clean things up and, you know, mm -hmm. I'll give an example, a real life example. And this was a, a gentleman and his wife and they sold, they had a dry cleaner mm -hmm. and it was a, the largest dry cleaner in, in Collier County. Mm -hmm. And which is Naples, Florida. Okay. And the dry, what he did is he would mark any personal expense with a Z at the end. So if it was like the purchase of clothes for him and his wife, he would put it in his warranty work, right? <laughs> so you say, oh, he had to replace damaged clothes that weren't actually damaged. But he would put a Z at the end and it would be like, um, you know, new dress. Oh, my goodness. Z. Yeah. <laughs> and we knew that was a personal expense. So having that level of detail in your books to know what's yes. personal, what's, um, you know, business related. If you're going to do if you're going to run your business, 
you know, as your personal uh, checking account, make sure you do something to clearly demark what is personal or discretionary or a one time, you know, event, just get that discipline to, you know, mark your journal entries with something that indicates that, that tip, you know, what it is. that tip right there, Eric is probably a time saver for not only yourself or other brokers out there, but even the person who's considering selling their business, because I know many, again, myself looking at buying small, medium sized companies who run their companies like their own personal checking or savings accounts. And then when the buyer comes in to go due diligence or ask questions, you don't get a lot of trust right away because you don't know what's personal and what's not personal. So, you know, to hear you say that, set yourself up for sale. You got to think that way, right? Because somebody's going to come in and start asking tough questions. Yeah. And if you're like, and you don't want to, you know, if you've got a general ledger that you can print out, yes, you know, You've got your warranty expenses yes. there and you've got you know, $2,800 of warranty expenses that are legit that aren't marked with that, you know, uh, notation. And then you've got another 5,600 that are marked with that notation. And, you know, you probably are not going to have to go back and find all the receipts for those to show them to a seller. Um or a buyer, I'm sorry, you know, to convince them that, you know, yeah, this was the uh, dress my wife wore to the Cattleman's Ball. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. You know? Oh, and this is, you know, a thousand dollars worth of fishing gear we bought, you know, to go fishing. Um, you know, yes, it was really funny. I mean, one of the nicest dressed guys I've ever, you'd ever meet because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all the words. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Every time I do Tommy Bahama shirt. Yeah. But, uh, you know, great guy, but he did it in a way where it was very clearly understood, not only by the buyer. Yeah. We actually took it to the bank. Wow. And I sat down with the banker and the banker gave us credit. Because you're so honest and so transparent. And you almost never get credit for those kind of expenses from a bank. If they see warranty work, they think it's, you know, they're, yeah, that's a that's a legit business business expense. We're not even going to look at it as a you know uh, an owner benefit or lifestyle expense. But we got the bank to add it back, and you know, and that increased the amount of the loan that the buyer was provided. You know, and ultimately the value of the business. So the so, key yeah. message there: the more transparent be, they were, the better it was, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, you don't want to you know you don't want to uh, notate it as personal expense. You just want some kind of coding right. in there that you know that's between you and you, and no one else. You know, until a buyer, uh, until a broker and a buyer get involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because obviously, you, you know, if you were ever to be audited or something to that effect, you don't want the IRS digging through there and understanding what what that means. Of course, right? of course. Uh, Keith Bill is here live in the lab, wrapping up our conversation with Eric J. Gall here, uh, live in the Business Athlete Performance Lab. Eric, a uh, couple minutes before we say goodbye, uh, I'm a big proponent of remote work, virtual work, uh, results only work, um, work where you need to work to get your work done. You don't have to come to the office. Uh, I would be curious to hear your point of view. You run a team, you worked in corporate America with teams. Uh, I would love to hear your, your feedback, your point of view on remote results oriented work. Well, doing what we do, you know, right now, you know, selling businesses, uh, you know, you don't need an office, exactly. Um, you know, and we don't need to get together, uh, you know, in, in an office. So we all work remotely. I mean, this is, you're seeing my home office, yep. uh, you know, when I'm in the office, you know, this is where I'm at. Now, yep. what I do have is conference room space. Yes. So if I do need to meet someone, I mean, a little, it's literally right around the corner from me. You know, a five minute drive and I'm there, Yeah. you know, and they pick up my mail, you know, I'll meet clients there, uh, you know, and it works great. Um, but as far as, you know, desk work and office time, you know, I'm uh, old enough now where there's no kids at home. So it's easy for me to sit down here, you know, with my, uh, you know, 12 step commute to the office. Um, you know, it's so much more efficient for me that I can, you know, jump in, get to work right away, um, you know, step out, grab lunch grab dinner, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, just continue working when I want to work. It's just, I think more efficient and, you know, with all the tools nowadays with, uh, 
you know, like uh, Zoom calls or Microsoft Teams and, you know, all the alternatives out there. It's very easy just to get everybody together. You know, uh, you know, we do it on a weekly basis where we yeah. go through our deals and talk about, you know, any help that we need on them. And it works great. So, so Eric, yeah, remote work is the way to go. I love it. Yeah, you, you and me both. So where do you think, the, where do you think uh, the thinking comes from? as we're seeing more return to work mandates. Again, you, you worked in corporate America, I believe it was with Ford. Um, where, where, where do you think those return to work mandates come from? Is it, is it because companies are recognizing that their office buildings are worth so much money in these downtown cities and if they don't have people, there's no value in their buildings and the cities are dying and there's more underlying themes happening here, which is simply, it's not as black and white as just getting people back to the office. Like what? What's behind these mandates, Eric, in your point of, from your point of view? Well, I mean, you've got, you know, folks like you and I, you know, we've been business owners. We've been, you know, at the top of the food chain. So, you know, we're driven, we're focused, we're, you know, uh, incentivized to, to work. Because if we don't, you know, the business falls down, yes. business falls down, money doesn't come in, you starve. Yes. But an employee has got a different mindset. I mean, they've got a paycheck. Right. So whether they're they're going to collect that paycheck, whether they're sitting at home or they're in an office. So I think it just depends on the worker. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, each individual business owner has got to take and make an assessment, you know, of their individual employees and what's going to motivate them to work. And I know I know there's people out there, you know, who are self-motivated just like us. And they know they're getting that paycheck. And if they're staying at home, they're probably adding that commute time to the, you know, the time that they're working. But, you know, there's also, you know, the other folks who will go log in on their computer at eight o'clock and then crawl back in bed till nine 30. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. You know, we'll take advantage of the system because humans are humans. Yes. Right. And we're all wired differently. And I think that's probably what's driving it is, you know, you've got business owners just taking a look at their staff and they're going, hmm, can I trust them, you know, to do the work that they're being asked to do, or are they going to game the system by staying at home? And I think, you know, some of them look at it and go, I think they're, you know, my staff's going to game the system. They need to come in. We need to monitor them and make sure, you know, that the work that they say they're going to get done gets done. Yeah, that, that's so, you know, we've run out of time to continue that, but that's, that, that to me is tragic because if a business owner is considering that, then the business owner has failed. It's not the employee's fault. They've hired the wrong people, right? So if, you, if you're not trusting your people to deliver the results, well, then you've hired, um, you've hired children instead of hiring adults. And I think, I think if you hire adults, and I'm going to be controversial, you can empower them. If you're hiring children, you're going to manage them. Um, and if, if that's the attitude you have, then I just think you're not going to set yourself up for success, frankly. Right. Well, you know, there's also a, a huge labor issue right now. Of course. Um, yeah. Yes. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about, you know, contractors in Southwest Florida, um, you know, that I talk to every day. Yes. And we've had the same, same story from like uh, Marina owners, because one of my uh, team members, focuses predominantly on waterfront type businesses like marinas, boat tours okay. and the like. Yeah. And that's his background. So we've gone in and I, you know, and I, I talk to businesses every, every day and I said, what's your biggest challenge right now? And they're, they tell you, tell me it's the labor pool. We cannot hire enough people to meet demand. Incredible. And the ones we get, the ones we get tend not to be, you know, the hardest working people. Yes. But we have to have people. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, any other challenges with the labor pool, you know, uh, do they come in, you know, uh, you know, knowledgeable, trained, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, well, you know, and this is, this is kind of one of the oddest things that I've ever heard. Yeah. And it was, well, one of the biggest problems we have right now is is with workers comp and disability. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they said, well, and this is going to be controversial. I'm, and I've heard it over and over and over again. Well, the employees have learned how to go in and talk to a doctor and get a medical marijuana card so they can sit home and smoke dope all day. 
<laughs> so I'm like, seriously. And they're like, yeah, I, I mean, I can show you, you know, I've got four people on disability right now, you know, and they all did the same and it's all the same thing. It's all the same discussion they had with the doctors and they all, you know, received medical marijuana cards and they're all not showing up for work for six months. That's interesting. So, you know, can, cannabis is legally federal here in Canada, in this country, where, where I live. And, and uh, uh, maybe that's the argument why there's so many people who I, I hear the same conversation from business owners, too. I can't find people. I can't get anybody to work. And maybe they're all sitting back somewhere high somewhere. <laughs> Not wanting to work. Eric, I... Um, I any, uh, any, any closing I comments before we say virtual, that there you go? Well, Hey, um, so I, 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 I never considered how political the topic of cannabis was in, in your country. Uh, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a big investor in, in the, in, in the, in the industry waiting for it to be legalized in the U S so I can see some return on my investment. Um, obviously being here in Canada, um, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's more cannabis shops on the corner down the street here than there are anything else. Like they're they're they pop up everywhere. Frankly, um, it's it's a business that's struggled in this country because the government hasn't done they have done have done, not done a very good job supporting it. Um, but it's uh, it's it's incredible to me how politicized it is in the United States, uh, and, and I would say how unf yes. how unfortunately politicized it has become. You know, it's one we tried to get into, and. Um... You know, whether it's cannabis shops, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, contractors specializing in, you know, development of grow houses. Yeah. And, and what we found is, you know, the uh, it's not approved for loans and banks true. generally won't touch it. No, no so, that's why we need the safe banking got, act to happen. We need, we need, we need, we need the Senate, we need the Senate yeah. to pass the safe banking act. How do I know as a Canadian? Because I pay a lot of attention so I can get a return on my investment, but we need that safe banking act to happen down there in the States. So we yeah. can, so we can have the banks open up the doors and have loans open up and, and, and have that industry start to crack the doors open to opportunity for all these business owners that are trying to build a legitimate business. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you, you know, you look, they popped up everywhere and, you know, you talk about politicizing it, you know, and how they went about, you know, granting licensing and yes. everything else, you know, in the States. And I mean, it's, you know, it was favors and it's incredible. It's I, I never, <laughs> it is. I never would have invested the money I was going to invest if I just maybe my own naivety, Eric, but um, the layers of, you know, politicization, or politics involved sorry in, in the united states has been has been has oh been, yeah it's been a, it's been a, an interesting ride to to witness that is for that's for sure and considering the different points of view right you have so many people in the states that are like come on just get on with it right but but there's that there's that that stigma that's attached to cannabis that um people just can't erase cheech and chong from their heads right and i listen no judgment i i get it i i grew up in the cheech and chong era and i'm uh but i, I it's it's a stigma that won't go away um, and until, until we just, we need time to pass for those, for those things to change. It's, you know, it's like any other plant, you know, that's yes. used for medicinal purposes, you know, yes. a lot of them have very good, yes. you know, applications. Yes. You know, a lot of, all of them have, you know, bad applications. So it's just depends yes. on how it's used and applied and everything else. And, you know, if, if, um, you know, government wants, you know, a role in it, they should just make sure that it's not being abused. And that's it. Yes. Other than that, they should stay out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no arguments there. No argument. Well, it's incredible. So in this country, you can drive down the street to the liquor store and you can fill up your truck with as much tequila or vodka or hard liquor you want and go cause as much damage you want to anybody, but you can't walk out of the mm -hmm. cannabis store with more than, you know, a couple of drinks or, you know, an ounce of cannabis. It's, it's again, it's, there's these, the government just has to stay out of it. That's just my point of view. But yeah, and I mean, I look at from my days at Ford. You know, I had I had uh, you know employees that were alcoholics. I had employees yeah. that you know uh, partook in you know uh, cannabis on the weekends. Yeah, you know, even in the evening, maybe I don't know. Yeah, and you know, ten to one, I'd rather have the person who is partaking in cannabis as the employee versus the person. Who was an alcoholic? Right, right, right. Because right. the alcoholics were, were belligerent, um, moody, 
Um, uh, you know, they felt like crap when they came into work, weren't productive, you know, until maybe mid afternoon when they started drinking again sometimes, um, you know, and then, but the, uh, the, the smokers, um, you know, were generally happy and productive and they came into work, not hung over and, you know, productive. It, it's so, true. It, and it's, it, there's a stigma. I got to tell you, Eric, I'm glad we went here because I, uh, I'm a big believer in today's world of being authentic, you know, cause I think that so much of the world is so, is so, uh, curated. Right. So the more authentic you can be and I can be, the more honest we are with our audience. Right. So the more honest, you, you know, the more business you get, the more business I get because people want to deal with real human beings, right? Not manufactured glossary yeah. personas. Right. So I'm glad we, I'm glad we went down this path and talked about, you know, cannabis and alcohol and, and, and whether cannabis is making people lazy and why people aren't going to work because of it. There's so there's a whole host of issues. Right. It's it's it's. Uh, but it, it's, it's it's not not as black and white as we would like it. I, I can tell you that. That's for sure. Yeah, it's a difficult problem to solve, right? Because uh, there's so many facets to it, and you know everybody's got their opinions on it. But like I said, it's almost a, it's almost an individual type situation, just like with anything, yes. right? You know, some people can handle certain things. You know, you know, for example, drinking. I mean, it's very easy for me to go to an event, have one drink, two drinks at the max, and then stop. Sure. You know, I don't need to have five or six drinks. Or some people. If they're once they start, they can't stop, you know, that right. addictive behavior. Same thing with, you know, cannabis, I'm assuming could be anything, um, you know, I don't know because I really don't smoke it. But, you know, the the reality is, is, you know, some individuals will be able to, you know, suppress or, you know, are naturally it's suppressed, you know, that desire for alcohol or cannabis or what have you. Um, you know, non-addictive behavior, I guess you'd call it, um, you know, and others just have that addictive behavior. So it's it's something that just needs to be looked at, you know, individual by individual and decisions made in the best interests of the individual. And, and you know what, and spoken about, right? And talked about without judgment, right? And I think that is also yeah. what we as human beings jump to so quickly. Oh, Eric, Eric smokes weed, I'm going to judge Eric. Or Eric likes to have his drinks, I'm going to judge Eric. Well, you know what? Let's not judge. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. Let's get out of the echo chamber. That's the other thing that drives me nuts with today's world is that we all have to get into an echo chamber. I'm sorry. We all have to get into an echo chamber. We all have to agree with each other and because we all want to make each other feel good. Yet we can't, yet somewhere along the line in the last number of years, we've lost this ability to have a discourse of debate or of dialogue or of, or of a, I, I, you know, I don't agree with you, Eric, but I, I respect you. Right. And it's so, but we've lost course with that along the way. It's, it's really unfortunate to me. Oh yeah. Everything's just painted black and white. Right. You know, and I look at it as, you know, if someone if someone is, uh, you know, smoking weed and it's interfering with their ability to do a job because they're doing it on the job, yeah. that's one thing. Yes. But if you got someone who's got back pain at the end of the day, you know, their back seizes up, it hurts, and you know they do it, and it helps alleviate their back pain. You know, why are we even having a discussion? You know. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because I just had this conversation with my mother. My mother is not feeling very well these days. And so I'm an advocate. For, I'm an advocate for cannabis. I haven't had a drink in seven years. Um, I said, that's just not part of my lifestyle. It's not good for me. Not, it just doesn't, yeah. doesn't work. For, it doesn't work the business yeah. athlete lifestyle. Some would say cannabis doesn't either, but it, but it works for me. The CBD elements, the THC elements, I, I, I enjoy it. I had this conversation with my mother because she's having immense back troubles. And I'm like, hey, you know, she's 75. And, but, for her, Eric, it's the stig, right? It's like, oh no, I'm not Cheech and Chong. I'm like, no, mom, we'll put some cream on there, right? Or we'll, we'll just go have some tea, right? It's just, it's, but, but those, those, those elements of stigma still, still persist, frankly, and judgment, right? So, unfortunately, so yeah, and I mean the THC element, and then the non-THC, of course. Element. So you know, for, for some people. You know, like your mother, you just got to explain to her that, okay, if it doesn't have THC, there's no hallucinogen in there. It's just, yeah. you know, it's basically, you know, rubbing, you know, plant leaves on your back. That's it. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. No, we want to give mom you the know, THC, Eric. No, no. <laughs> you could go grab, you go grab some maple leaves and rub them on your back. Yeah. It's the same stuff. When I said, when I, when, when right. my kid, when my kids heard that I said, when I, when my, when my kids heard that I recommended grandma try some cannabis, so kids are all like, dad, we all want to be there when grandma has that edible. 
So I'm like, no, no, we're just talking CBD. No, no, we got to give grandma the real good edibles and we'll see how she is. So that was a whole fun conversation that one day. Hey, listen, uh, it's 10 after uh, the hour. You've been really gracious with your time. I, I certainly got more time of you than I would have expected. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. Before we wrap up and say goodbye, uh, is, there anything, is there anything you want to leave the audience with? Uh, one tip, a couple tips. Final word is to you, Eric Gall. Uh, no, I mean, the only thing that I'll say has been a, it's been a pleasure speaking with you Thank and, you. uh, you know, telling, sharing stories and, and the like, I always enjoy that. You know, it's always a good use of my time because, you know, it gets you out, uh, out of the, you know, that focus, yeah. you know, serious, uh, all day long, um, you know, business mode and more into that personal mode. So I, I love that. And, uh, you know, um, but uh, yeah, I guess if anybody needs help, you know, buying or selling a business or looking in Florida, I also do deals in the Midwest. You know, feel free to contact me. That's awesome. Uh, Eric, stick around while I play us out with some dual Lipa. Uh, we're going to uh, put the camera back here. We're going to play some Lipa on. And, uh, and uh, it's Tuesday. You're here with Keith Ellis live in the lab, live in the business athlete performance lab special guest today was eric gall we talked mergers acquisitions and all these great business topics we went down the path of cannabis we went down the path of selling businesses thousand pieces to sell your business etc etc check us out live on demand check us out tomorrow joel Yi, noon central time minus five gmt live in the lab keith bellis i'm out have a great day